Um, waiting. There we go. Hello, everyone. Um, this is another winner's interview with Alistair Unicom, who won the Battle of Britain. Hi, Alistair. Hello. And um, and I've I've done like one of these before, um, where I interviewed um, the uh, Ryan, the the winner of uh, what was that tournament called in in Atlanta, also in Atlanta. Um, so, so this is a format that I'm sort of trying and, and getting my way into. And, and basically um, what's going to happen here is that Alistair is going to tell us about some of his games. And I hope that I get to ask you some, some questions about your thought process before and after uh, a tournament, especially because you won it. So maybe people can learn something. Well, fingers so, crossed, Paul. You never know anything can happen. You never know. Right. I'm going to share my screen because Alistair and me, we of course, we have a little, there's a little PowerPoint. Um, he requested that that I had some some stuff about the um, the different lists that he was facing, which I have covered them on my channel here, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we are going to like give a little bit of detail for each. Unfortunately, Alistair, I couldn't find pictures of the actual tables you were playing on, so I do have a lot of pictures from uh, the the um, event itself, but here okay. we go. Um, so you won Battle of Britain uh, a few weeks back. Um, have you? Did you get home all right? Was the event okay? Uh, the event was fantastic. I could not tell you much about it. Was held in um, Birmingham at the UK Games Expo. Yeah. I could not tell you how good the expo was. Um, it you didn't enormous. see it. <laughs> I, I never got enough time to do it. What? What I will be doing is that um, it was run by the Juggernaut podcast team, who I'm yep. sure a lot of your, your audience are aware of, yep. and I'll be appearing on their podcast to do a full review of the event. So not doing what we're doing, we're going in-depth into the games. Yep. Um, when I talk to the Juggernaut guys, I'll be talking about their event, how, how did yep. it run, how was the pack, what was the They have that like? whole format good... where they go everything, yeah. they go over everything for, for events, yeah. so that's, that's really so... cool. So I'm getting so, to do their format back ah, them on on, nice. on what what I will say is a premier event and it was brilliant. Yep. So yep. Um, but I would I would suggest you you go over to their channel whenever it's ready. Um, but for you, Bo, we are you you like talking. We're all in games. on competitive gaming here. Yes, although I am branching so, out a bit. But so right. So we're going to talk my list. Um, let's some let's laptops. start with with some of the thoughts yeah. before you list built. Um, by the way, here we have some of the images from from the event itself, some of the the tables uh, that we can see here. Um, but but uh, what do you do before you build a list for an event? Do you actually like tailor build a list for your events that that you go to, or or is do you do you like build a list for a year, or what what's your process before you start building a list? The first thing before you get to list building is reading the player pack for the event. Yep. And I can tell you straight off that as soon as the player pack came out, I read it and I knew exactly the army that I wanted to take. Okay. Um, and I also knew the army I wanted to take because I knew what my goal was for, yep. it's called the Battle of Britain Grand Tournament. And the, it was being held at the UK Games Expo. So it's a huge, you know, event that's taking place. Mm. And then our our game is, you know, a, a small fish in a big pond, but it's still, yep. um, for me, carried a lot of gravitas. Yeah. So I knew that my goal was to go and win. I wanted to go and make my very best attempt to win. Yeah. So upon reading the pack, I knew straight away the type of army that I wanted to put together. And and that's the same for every event I, I go to. Did did I, did you uh, once you sat down with the pack? Did you sort of figure out what is what is is likely to to appear here, or what did you do for? How did you sort of pre-read the meta? For that, I and again, this is true of every event I approach. Mm. I don't think about what other people will take. Okay. I always focus upon taking an army that I know I could win games with. Yeah. Um, regardless of what comes up, because if you get caught in that spiral, you'll start yeah. to worry about things that you might never ever see. You know, if you start to worry about yeah. um, the Luftwaffe field division 
you know, 60 inches of barbed wire. Which, you'll... which did appear here, right? It was supposed to. It never did. I think uh, the player couldn't make it on the day. Sadly. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. I, I really want to see that army play. Yeah. Um, but again, though, if you start to spiral into, um, you know... You're, you're never of, going to stop. Of, no, a, a fear of, you know, encountering yeah. a, a US Marine uh, barbecue list with, you know, five Dodge trucks, five engineer yeah. squads, flamethrower team, or even worse, the, um, the Mariana and Palau assault troops that have got two flamethrowers in the squads. There's, yeah. If you start yeah. to worry about these things, you'll never get, you'll never take control for yourself. Mm. So I know that if I'm going to a, a tournament for enjoyment, mm. I'll I'll take units that I think I want to try out as an experiment and, and have and fun with, of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and have fun with. An example of that was an event in Aberdeen called uh, Northern Lights. Yeah. I, it was a thousand points and I decided that I didn't want to take it seriously. So I wanted to have a nice game, a nice, a nice day out. So I took an IS two. I took a Soviet list with an IS two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know, crazy. It was like <laughs> over over a third of the points in one time mm-hmm. straight away. But I went for a good time. I had a good yep. time. I played three games. I got three draws, and I finished in the middle of the pack. Exactly what I wanted perfect. to do that day. Perfect, perfect. Um, you flip that on its head. There was a another event in Scotland called um, Attrition. I think you reviewed it on your channel. I did. Um, yeah. when you, you start at twelve fifty, then a thousand points, then seven hundred and fifty. I decided that I wanted to go and win that event because it looked like a challenge. Yeah. Uh, every list was tailored to the. They told you what the mission was, so you could tailor your list to the mission that you were being played each round. Uh, and I, I did go and win that event um, yeah. using the Soviets again. Yeah. Um, and so with that that mindset reading the Battle of Britain player pack, uh, knowing that it was a fully competitive pack with theatre selectors, single or double genetic platoon, tank platoon, mm. basically full unit access uh, yeah. via the campaign books. Um, I, I knew that all other players would, would take it, you know, competitively. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to bring the, the best army that I felt that, that would work for me. Yeah. And and I have to ask you here, I, I sort of know the answer because I've seen a lot of Alistair's lists, but uh, maybe other people don't know the answer. A lot of people, they have a certain play style, a certain style of of uh, of how they want their units to interact and, and what they want their army builds, basically. Um, and um, do you take that into account or do you just say, oh, right, I'm I'm not looking into what I, I usually play. I just, I, I want to win this. I think this would be the best. That's what I'm doing. I have got the Swiss Army Knife toolbox style approach. You do, yeah. Um, I know that for me, for the play style, I, I, I like to be able to look down at the table and know mm. that I've got to, a tool for every job. Yeah. You know, so I like to look down and know that I've got a mortar. Yeah. I like to look down and know that I've got a sniper. Um, I very much enjoy having um, at least one engineer squad, somebody that can, you know, really go in and really, you know, mm. kick some heads in. Yeah. Uh, I I I know I like a, a a reasonable dice count. I don't do well with high dice count armies. I don't do well with low dice count armies. Mm. Um, and it's the same. Like I like to look down, and I don't. I'm not looking to rely upon multi launchers. Uh, yeah. You know, like like I, I think I may be used to in the past. Mm. I know that I do want some sort of transport element. Maybe not an entire, you know, fleet of mechanized you know, uh, force. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not a fully mechanized force, but at least two transports. Maybe one yep. of them being armored, if possible. Yep. You know, a half track or a brain carrier. Mm. Uh, I also will all will try to have a good lieutenant. I'm I use snap to action quite a lot. Yeah, uh, much so more than me, people. If, oh. if you want to ever talk about snap to action and and how that is good, Alistair is the guy to yep. to bring on the channel because he he does it. I don't. I I do it a lot if I can. Yep. Um, so it means that if I'm going to have a lieutenant, he's going to be regular. Yep. Uh, and he'll he'll have an assistant just to to add that extra sort of submachine gun mm. um, power in there. So it's having it's having lots of elements, and then it's also staying away from the things as I said I don't like. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm not very confident in close assault as as in initiating a close assault. Yeah. Uh, I, I see it as 
too much high risk. Um, it is, yeah. In the same way, I don't like having, say, too many inexperienced troops mm. or too many veteran troops or too yep. many regular troops. There has to be a balance, uh, and that's across all units. Um, yep. So I've, I don't, well, no, I, I've done these things to discover what I like and don't like. So I've ran all veteran yep. armies. Yep. I've ran all inexperienced armies. Um, and I've ran all regular armies, and I enjoy all regular because it's the middle of the road. Mm. But to make that even better, then I'll I'll decrease some units that don't need to be regular. You know, everybody, your multi launcher doesn't need yeah. to be yeah. regular or have save the veteran. points there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then spend those extra points and making one of the engineer squads veteran, so they've got yeah. some more staying power. Yeah. Um, so it's it's that it's that Swiss Army knife toolbox toolbox approach which, um, yeah, I think makes you a better player. It um, does, and in yeah. and for me, I I'm so, sort of seeing a little bit of a shift from mono builds towards that. Um, more and more of the the tournaments are being won by people who have that approach in their list, um, which I guess is a, a really good uh, development. Not for me though. I'm very much of a monobuild person, but <laughs> that doesn't really matter. But, but that's the thing, though, Bo, and that's what the audience of your channel have got to understand. Yep. That if you're looking for success, you've got to f discover what success is for you. Yeah, um, exactly. And and listening to your channel and the other guests that you have on, uh, yep. we all bring something different. Yeah. And you've your audience have got to navigate that path um, to success. Exactly. Right. So these were the, the thoughts before we actually get to the list building. Now, the list itself. Um, so what you were bringing was um, a British tank platoon, and I reviewed this uh, on my channel. Um, so everyone could go in and watch the review. I was immediately like, this is a top tier list. It's really, really good. It had four of the uh, upgunned uh, stewards, the darker stewards. One of them had a command vehicle. A Crusader uh, anti-air gun with a double uh, light auto cannons, uh, engineers like you talked about, some home guard with a BAR, free Indian squad, a forward artillery observer, inexperienced MMG team, which we're going to have to talk about um, because there were specific reasons for that, medium mortar with a spotter, sniper, flamer team, 25 pounder, brain carrier, jeep, and a truck. Well, T because you had to have everyone in a truck somewhere. Yeah. So, um, so what was your thoughts here? Before I kick into the thoughts from the player pack, there were three main takeaways from the player pack that you had that I felt were important and guided me towards this list. The first one was the the points. So mm. you got five points for a major win. Yep. Four for a minor win, three for a draw, two for a minor loss, and one for a major loss. I am sure that's how it was. Yep. More importantly, though, the difference between a major win and a minor win. So if you simply just won your game and you got a minor win, you got your four tournament points. To get a major win, you had to beat your opponent by 10 victory points within the mission. Um, mm. And and to you know before you read the missions, a victory point is killing a unit. Yeah. You know, so in a normal sort of no man's land kill points event, if you beat your opponent by two or more, you win the mm. game yeah. and you would get a minor a minor victory. But minor victories won't be enough to win a, I, a grand tournament, I, will they? Exactly. I firmly believed that if you wanted to be if you wanted to win the GT you needed to be stacking on major victories as yep. often as humanly possible. Yeah. So I knew that I needed to be able, this is before even reading the missions properly. I knew that you needed to be able to stack on the kills to make sure that you could get 10 victory points more than your opponent to get that five yep. points. That was takeaway number one. Takeaway number two was within the special rules. And this is where the inexperienced medium machine gun team comes in. Ellie? Uh, Alistair? We, we, had a back. we had a short cut. Can you go back like 10 seconds? Of right. course. Um, Medium machine gun. 
Yeah, takeaway number two was the medium, the, the addition of the inexperienced medium machine gun. So yep. the juggernauts had extracted from their their own player pack that they use at their own events, um, a rule called suppression. And the suppression rule was that if a medium machine gun team, not anywhere else, not in a vehicle, not in a, not in a squad, a team, or a heavy machine gun team, issued a fire order against an infantry or artillery unit, then that target unit automatically gets a pin just for being targeted. And then you would roll the dice to shoot. And if you manage to hit, then you would cause a second pin. Uh, every turn, the target could only ever receive one suppression pin. So, you know, if you fired six medium yep. machine guns, you'd only yep. ever get one suppression pin. Yeah, yeah. Um, so an inexperienced MMG team automatically was included in my list straight away. That was an auto include for me as well. If I was yeah. building that, yeah. I would, I yeah. would even uh, like. Uh, I, I think I, in one of the videos, I suggested going for uh, three American inexperienced MMG teams in an American list, right? Um, it, that, it would, that would really help. Really good. Yeah. yeah. So, but thirty-five points for an automatic pin at thirty-six inches. Yeah. Yes, it's a bargain. So the third, the third major takeaway was how objectives were claimed and contested. And it was uh, it was a terminology that I like to use. It's called tap and run. Mm. Um, I heard another term used as sticky mm. uh, objectives. And effectively, at the end of every turn, you check for ownership of an objective. Um, and they're claimed and contested in exactly the same way. You know, mm. um, vehicles can contest them, troops can claim them, and also contest them. But once it was yours, you could move away from it, and it would always remain yours until a turn where an enemy infantry or artillery unit was there and there were no other enemy units around, then that would flip over. Yep. Um, and also, it meant that at the end of a turn, so if you, if you started a turn and you owned the objective and you had an infantry squad nearby, and at the end of the turn, if an enemy vehicle was there and you would check for ownership, that would still be yours. Mm. Because you could, yeah, okay, yeah. Because you started the turn owning the objective, mm. uh, and you've got an infantry unit there that, that still can claim it, um, so the, the vehicle doesn't get the chance to contest it. So that would mean that you need some units that are mobile that can go out and tap the objectives. Wouldn't yeah. Um, but it also meant that there was no, um, you know, stuff like the German uh, motorbike from the yeah. armored car slot. It can't just suddenly yeah. appear at the end of a turn and contest and, an objective and then yeah. you lose or it's a draw. Yeah. It, that yeah. was eliminated. So those were the three main takeaways from the player pack. Yeah. Uh, and, and I made sure that I understood them. And it sounds really silly to say it, but <laughs> as a lot of people will game, not do anything for uh, to to adapt to that no as and as we talk through the games bo i'll highlight different moments where different players mm. came unstuck with, with yep. that um but so with all that taken into account back to the list mm. uh, i am on record in other places probably your channel as well bo that if you have the option of taking a tank platoon to an event yep you take a tank platoon to an event you if, do. if you you, your goal is to win um, I, I agree. At a pinch, at a pinch, there are good theater selectors out there that can give you the same thing, mm. um, which I I agree with. Um, but if the tank the tank platoon is the easier path, uh, the choices, the choice. Well, I as I said, within a week of the player pack came coming out, I had a list and I sent it to the juggernauts just to make sure. It's like, can I do this? Mm. Uh, and their response was, "Yep, you're yep. a cheesy, cheesy bugger, but yes, you can do it." <laughs> yep. Um, and so that's yeah. that's that's what we did. Uh, so the original list actually had a um, stag hound in it, mm. but that that fell away because I, it was the stag hound was doing the same job as one of the stewards, and I've got it, four it stewards. It usually does, yeah. Yeah, the stack hound. So, you take for me. You take the stack hound if you're running a generic reinforced platoon where you want mm -hmm. double tanks, and it is a tank even though it's on wheels, right? 
Um, yep. so, so that's why you take the stack hand for a, a, um, a tank platoon. Might as well take another steward. Yep. Exactly. Um, so I dropped that and I think at the same time I was I was reviewing some lists the, from mm. a theatre selector. Um, I was a Canadian theatre selector and I saw the Crusader there. And yeah. then I dug, I dug deeper and uh, I found the option to make it um, close top. Mm. So for 135 points and um, I'm going to talk a lot about the Crusader. <laughs> she was magnificent. Oh, that's nice. Right. Absolutely magnificent. But then as you cascade through the list, so it was five regular engineers, three submachine guns, flamethrower, um, they mm -hmm. were Canadian. The home guard unit was originally bigger, but I needed to strip out miniatures for points. Yep. Um, so I actually think it was seven home guard in the end. Um, and they were, being... they were your backline holders unless yes. they turned uh, regulars, right? And then they might push a little bit forward. I don't think they ever passed the halfway point yep. on a the table. They were very much the back line. Yep. Um, you know, it was a British Indian platoon, so I had uh, manpower of the Empire for the 10 mm. free regular Indians, yep. the forward artillery observer. Yep. And then, you know, I'm opening up my toolbox, yep. regular medium mortar with a spore, yep. the regular sniper, the flamethrower team. Uh, the Jeep was mm. there as the tow for the 25 pounder. But in reality, it was the transport for the flamethrower team. Yep. Uh, and then the brain carrier had the engineers and when required the truck would transport the Indians. Yep. <laughs> Up to an objective, shameless... set them off. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I will make a shameless admission mm. uh, that I modeled for advantage with the truck and I took the canopy off. You did? <sighs> yep. Right. Uh, because you don't you don't need the canopy on you the don't, truck. You don't need to and, and it turns it into like a huge block. Um, yep. Yeah. Turns so it into a huge it, target. It does. However, yeah. so, it also means that you have a large line of sight blocking model. <laughs> so yeah, there, there are um, pluses, pluses it's, and minuses. It's swings and roundabouts, but I, yep. Yep, but I wanted uh, a lower profile for the truck. And so I yep. removed the canopy. Uh, yep. And to my knowledge and to you know, everybody I spoke to, nobody had issue with it. Because yep. uh, I know you can do exactly the same with the yep. German um, Opal Blitz. When you're physically constructing it, you can leave yep. the canopy on or you off. Just leave it off. Um, just leave but, it off. But people, like, look at this. This, the all the small teams here, all this, plus the engineers, that was what Alistair was talking about with his uh, toolbox list here. He opens up, he takes one of each things and... Um, for you, the medium motor is still a regular with a spotter here? Yeah. yeah. Not the running in inexperienced, this. yeah? No, the reason for this boat is to, um, I wanted to have good forward observers, good numbers of forward observers, because yep. uh, I wanted Getting to up, win that game. Up into, th up into the table, yeah. Yeah, so I, I have got four forward observer, uh, forward deployments, <laughs> so the artillery spotter, the sniper, the 25 pounder came with a spotter, and the medium mortar came with a spore. So yeah. I wanted to have four so that my sniper could go down last yep. or as close to last as possible, yep. um, which is one of the main reasons why it is, it is regular. Right. And I think I think maybe some people forget that game that's played before the game starts. They do. And, and some people play on that. Uh, I've seen people who just build lists designed to, to do forward deployment and just beat you out of the game because they're sitting on objective from the start. Right. Let's go to the games, Alistair. Game one was maximum attrition and you were fighting Simon Brecken. And uh, Simon had actually sent me his list beforehand for review. Um, so I had seen it. And it was the uh, cavalry and motorcycle madness. He had most of his infantry was somehow mounted either on horseback or on motorcycles. He had a lot of yep. forward deployers and he had a, a bunch of mixed supports. So, so what was your plan going into this game? Uh, Simon was a really nice guy and he was a good player. And he, he challenged me to this game um, because he, he wants to make himself a better player. He, yep. he wants to be a better player. And um, you know, he said he recognized me as one of the best players that was going to be there. And so he thought he'd um, throw the gauntlet down and see what he could learn, um, which I was humbled by. And I'd, I'd like yeah. to thank Simon for 
for giving me that opportunity. Um, it's a comp- It's a compliment. It really is. Huge when, compliment. When, when, when people want to fight you because they think you're good. Yeah. Huge compliment. Um, you know, Simon had a really good backline. He had a yeah. uh, uh, he had a heavy auto cannon anti aircraft gun. Yeah, he did. Uh, he had a Zest three. Um, he had the Katusha as well floating around the back line and he mm. had good numbers of infantry. He had good um, forward fast moving units uh, and he also had decent transports. So the plan for me, maximum attrition, um, I, I just wanted to push straight away with the with one flank mm. and uh, that was led by the two of the Stuarts. I had one Stuart on outflank, on the mm. same flank that I was pushing. It was the command Stuart, of course, because it gives of itself course. a bonus. Yes. Um, and that was assisted by the the brain carrier with the engineers. And then holding the centre was the native, uh, sorry, the Indian squad and the home guard. Yep. And, and uh, just because people might not know, maximum attrition was a version of kill points, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you would you were trying to push one flank. Um, did you try and set it up in during deployment so that that uh, Simon was spread out and he couldn't support that flank, or how did you actually make this? No, happen? Simon. Simon had his own plan, which I was aware yep. of. Um, he he set the center up. So yep. he centralized all his um, backline pieces mm. uh, and I offset to the left uh, and left my right flank open. And mm. uh, he was outflanking with both his Mongolian cavalry units yep. and he held he held quite a lot in reserve. So he was very much waiting for me to come to him, mm. which was the right tactic. Um, yep. And I have to say that by turn three, I I was properly nervous because um, mm. we were three kills each, Oof. and I knew yeah. that we I needed to start to to, to increase yeah. that. Yeah. But there were there were a handful of key moments, uh, and one of them was pretty much from sort of turn three and a half mm. when my left flank fully engaged with him. Uh, so, so the outflankers come on. The one outflank tank came on, and then yeah. I I stepped forward with the other two Stuarts in the brain carrier. Um, at that point, Simon was, you know, rightly so, going down with a lot of units. Yeah. Um, yeah, to keep them alive. Yeah. And then as that left flank of mine started to make gains, um, he made a few, I mean, they, to, to say they were desperate manoeuvres, but he knew the game was starting to, to run away from him. So he, so he, he needed to take chances. He was taking higher risks. Yeah, um, and that's when the game came to me. Uh, there were some highlights though for for Simon though. Uh, I decided to um, take a, a bit of a chance in the centre, and I moved my Indian squad in a truck forward because mm. I could I could see an easy kill. Mm. Um, he had a sort of forward deploying um, anti tank team in a building, and I thought, yep, yeah, I can get into that, that, that building and that get could them. That be easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I did. But what actually happened with the truck, though, the truck tried, the truck picked up a pin on the way. It tried to activate, it failed, it reversed, and it blocked a full intersection, and then it got destroyed. So my Stuart, <laughs> which was in the centre, had to redeploy oh. around a building. Yeah. And all the time, the Katusha was hitting this building and catching about three or four units, and he was quite unlucky not to get anything um, yeah. from that. Another moment that happened was that he he saw an opportunity and, and it was the right opportunity. He brought his, uh, oh, he had a Tokara quad match. Yeah, he did. Yeah, so so and he had double platoon. Uh, so he had yep. a Tokara in one platoon and the uh, Katusha in the other. Um, yep. So yeah, and, really and he, well supported. Yeah, he, he saw an opportunity. He brought, he brought the quad max in one from reserve and because uh, he caught my home guard out in the open at long range. Uh, so he, he put some kills on them and um, nothing happened with their green check. But what that then meant was that he had then exposed that piece. So I brought yep. the Crusader on um, yep. and the Crusader was way off in the right flank. Mm. And it just started grinding forward and shooting and shooting and shooting at this this Tokarav and it could not kill it. It was driving me bananas. <laughs> um, but a strange thing happened within the game. So it must have been on... 
partway through turn three, mm. and the the Crusader was twenty one inches up the board, and there was a copse of trees off to its left, but it was it was like an inch away from the board edge on the right flank, yep. and he brought his reserves on, which was the Mongolian cavalry, both coming on the right flank. So he measured the twenty four inches up, and it ran almost in line with the tank, or you know, slightly in front of the tank. Yeah. And what it meant was, though, is like, you, I'm really sorry, Simon, I had to say, it's like, this is a pure quirk of the rules, but you can't bring your unit within an inch of me. Yeah. So I'm I'm effectively blocking this area from you bringing your, your outflankers on. You'll have to bring them back a little further, further back, back towards yeah. you. Yeah. Which meant he had to go round this copse of trees which um, wasn't the optimum way. He wanted to bypass the tank, get yeah, behind Yeah, he wanted to go, get sort of, behind you, yeah, and, and down into your back lines. Yeah, because that's where the you know the mortar was hanging out there. The the medium machine gun team was sort of waiting on ambush just in case they came on, which they obviously yeah. did. Uh, and the green unit was down there, so it was a strange thing, but it was good for him to see the rule. Mm. And he actually, and they actually said it's like. What, so you could string out a whole unit and block part? I'm like, yes, you could. Yeah, you, you can could do that unit, if, you, but... if you're a bastard. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but it was an odd one. Um, but yeah. the other little interaction that he got to see was the Crusader again was moving mm -hmm. forward. And um, I decided to shoot at his officer. Mm. And I scored multiple hits. And I was able to um, daisy chain the templates off of his officer onto his cavalry unit, which then couldn't recce. Yeah, because they weren't because the main they, target. Because they weren't the target. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So yeah. Um, so he got to see some some rules interactions that he might not have ever seen, and it was just yeah. those moments that um. That, that was what he was playing it. you for. That was exactly yep. what he was playing you yep. for. Um, right. And it ended up being a big win. Were there any uh, mistakes that either you or Simon made that you think is worth uh, looking into and maybe learning from? I gave Simon a good debrief at the end and I had to tell yep. him that there was no um I've got your moments as I described yep. to them as described to him. There was nothing that he did when I instantly sort of dropped my hands and went, Yeah, yep. I've I've got you here. Yep. Um you know, so there's nothing really on his part. Uh, and again there was nothing really on my part. I mm. think perhaps being a bit too aggressive with the truck and the Indians at the start, I should yep. have I should have just counselled patience um because yeah, that maybe. Truck, that truck delayed my um, one of my stewards getting into the battle properly, um, and it also meant the end, that, that your truck died. So, and yes, and it was a dice. I didn't really want to lose at that point. So, yeah, yeah. right. That's, so that was the first game. Second game. Uh, by the way, was this a, a major, minor win for you? It was a major win. Yeah. Um, I think I can't remember the exact points. I'm sure it was something like thirty. But to... at, at some point, the, the, the kill dice just cascaded in your favor, right? Yeah. Um, I think at this in this game, your kills were worth two points each or something. There was there was, there was a quirk of the points with just this yeah. mission. Okay. Cool. Then we had capture and control for the second game, which was against Sean Ball. He had an 18 order dice Romanian mixed bag uh, um, platoon with pioneers in it. Three armored vehicles, one of them a Panzer III, the darker version. Uh, three HE, so mortars and uh, howitzers and, and multi-rocket launcher, I think. And Faust's on a lot of his infantry. So Faust is basically your antidote, right? Uh, you don't want to have a lot of Faust's uh, unless you can stay at range, which may be part of it. But this was capture and control, which, um, if I remember re correctly, that was either an objective mission or a, like a version it's, of... It's a variation on key positions. Variation on key positions, yeah. exactly, yeah. So we we had three objectives yep. to control. And um, I'm, I have to say, Sean was an excellent player. Uh, I really clicked conversationally with him. And he, mm. he plays for or around the Pegasus Warlords um, yep. gaming club in England. Um, I really enjoyed his company. It was a good, good conversation. Uh, I really liked his army, mm. and you know, I, I never really said to him. At, well, I did say to him at the time that I play Romanians a lot, mm. um, 
even some of the habits that Sean had with his uh, organization of his units and miniatures, I was like, yeah, I did exactly the same. <laughs> um, what what he may or may not have picked up from that was, I know his army inside and out because it's really, really similar to the armies I put yeah. together for Romania. Yeah. So I know what it can and can't do, and I know what it does and doesn't do well. Um, and I have to say, though, Sean played it well. Um, yeah. The thing that went wrong for Sean was he had to roll dice, and his dice oh. just abandoned him from turn oh. two and a half. From turn two and a half onwards, his dice no. just gave up. Oh, and that, that sucks. Happen. It was a real shame. Yeah. You know, rolling high for leadership to rolling low for shooting and yeah. damage. And that can't happen at a, at a GT level, especially when nope. across the table from you are four Stuarts and a Crusader. No, nope. no, nope. that's um, no and good. My, my, and my dice were just average. They they were yep. they roll exactly what they should. Um, so to say that we had three objectives. The objectives were worth five points each, and mm-hmm. it was um, two points per per kill. And neither of us were silly. We um, you know, we placed one objective each, sort of eight eight or ten inches on from each board board side, and yeah. then one was slightly sort of. In the middle ish off the center sort of thing. So there was there was Oh but Ali, that will mean that the game comes down to kill points, doesn't it? Yeah, that's pretty much and that's um and I'm okay with that. Um Yeah, but but I, okay, Sean wouldn't be. Not against your so, platoon, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's the no, whole that, that that smells like a mistake to me. Yep. Yeah. Um well for me I, I was comfortable with it happening that yeah. way. Um so what actually transpired was there was a on Sean's left flank he perfected an assault which was exactly how I would have done it. He had mm. two trucks yep. filled with two pioneers. He had his officer team. He had the Panzer three, um, and he had and the sniper was already forward deployed on yep. that flank. So he pushed with a really good attacking force. Uh, but I know that those because the trucks don't come with medium machine guns because they're Romanian. Yep. Yeah, um, and there's always something that what I've always found with a Romanian attack is that you almost want them to counterattack you, yeah, before you do your final push, so that they're just that little bit closer. Yeah, um, so I refused to do that. Yeah, um, I stood back stayed behind. at stayed stayed at range, shut them yep. up. Um, I, I had a Stuart, had the Romanian, uh, the had the Stuart, had the brain carrier with the engineers, and I had the home guard sitting mm. on the right flank. Uh, and I refused to engage him straight away. Yeah. Um, it was almost like a standoff. I wanted him to make the move first. Mm. Um, but but his attack was exactly as I would have done it myself. Which so what was your plan he, to win? Uh, well, I at that point I had one objective. Yeah. And he had one objective. Yeah. Uh, the other objective was in the center. So my objective, my my goal then was that I had committed a not a token force, but a smaller force to defend against a larger force, which left me three Stuarts and the Crusader yeah. um, to push, push forward. Yep, and it also left the ten Indians as the the claimer for the the central objective. Um, and that's and that's what happened. There there was a quirky moment though. He he had the he had the triple two mm? armored car, <coughs> and he drove it. It came on from reserve, and somehow it came on from reserve, or it came around the corner, and he drove it quite aggressively in front of one of his medium howitzers, and he opened up with the light alt cannons, and he killed my, he killed my mortar team. It was the first kill of the game, mm. and I was just in my head. I was like, "No, nah, I am not. I am not taking that." So I'll I'll launch the crusader back at it and immobilize it. <laughs> And of course, what that meant was that I had blocked himself up. <laughs> I blocked it. Um, so obviously, he can still go in direct, but he can't mm. fire directly. But and it, yep. he had control of that channel. Um, yep. But I just I kept on firing at this triple two, and uh, eventually I pinned it out. I had to pin it out. I had to get it to nine <laughs> pins to, to make it. To it's make just it an armored then, car. It's just an armored car. <laughs> yeah, but it had to go. Yep. Um, but what it meant was, though, that that then became 
a line of sight blocker still. Um, but this was the game. This is the first time that I had used the Crusader as a um, protector for two of the Stuarts. Yep. Um, in my head, she I refer to her as a girl. Don't yep. just accept it. <laughs> um, she, okay. um, you know, she was very much the mother hen, mm. very much the Avenger. Yeah. You know, so if one of her Stuarts got killed. Whatever it she was, would immediately would kill it right pounce back. on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that whole, my, again, it was my left flank. My whole left flank pushed um, and stripped out his howitzers. Um, there was an infantry squad in a truck. It just, I, everything just melted away. It's really sorry to, to say this, but it was Sean's inability to roll anything good for his shooting. Mm. So every, everything just melted away from sort of turn two and a half onwards. Okay. Um, but the the one thing he did do was he said that he had uh, his cavalry were on outflank mm. and they had a panzerfaust so the outflank came on and they shot a panzerfaust up the bum of a Stuart destroyed it and then the Avenger Crusader came round the corner and wiped them out <laughs> and so it was it was what, a really what big win. Uh, what ended up deciding this um, was there a moment that decided it or was it just bad luck on the dice all through the game the, the, there was no moments Yep. I would put it down to, truly for Sean, and he. I hope he watches this. Um, he never got the chance to fight because his dice decided, nope, you're not doing it. Mm. Um, you know, he's as his Panzer three fired three times, fired its main yep. gun three times at the Stuart on his his flank, yep. and either missed or failed to penetrate. Yep. And then once he had moved his attack forward. And my left flank had won effectively. Mm. I then thought, right, I'll push this Stuart. And the first time the Stuart fired at the Panzer, the Panzer Three destroyed it. It was just like, well, sorry. Mm. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Any was, mistakes you want to point out for this game? Uh, for Sean, he should know it was rolling that armored car in front of your howitzer. Yeah. Um, blocking his line of sight. That's for myself. Yeah. For myself, no mistakes. Oh. I was really patient. I made sure the the crusader was where she needed to be. Yeah. Um, just there as a, as a really strong, a really strong threat. Uh, what I would say though is this: I was this game was played quite close to the, the tournament organizers station, mm. and I um I leaned over and handed in the result, and I got something crazy like fair k it was like 32 points to five or something. It was it was an enormous win. Yeah. And one of the TOs joked and said, oh, look, your, your countryman, he's actually done a little bit better than you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's got he's got 33 points to four or something. And I said, oh, well done. And then I just asked, how many objectives did you have on the table? Oh, I had five. Like, <gasps> All right, mate. Well, you had, you had five objectives. So you had <laughs> 25 points. I only had three objectives, so... And it was at that point I just sort of looked at the TOs and went, I never really thought of that. You know, the, the that, victory that, points. That the will first. swing it, yeah. Well, the victory points were the first tiebreaker. Mm. Um, so I thought, that's a bit odd. I never had as many points available as I could have done. But, you know, it was just that. It was a little quirk, and I gave that to them as feedback. Um, yeah, yeah. For me, I'll point out one thing, and it's, it's I'm, I'm not uh, crabbing on Sean at all. But I think um, splitting your objectives into one in each zone is a mistake against your army because that will mean that this turns into more or less a, a kill point mission um, because yep. both of you could contest the one in the center and your army is set up to kill infantry and he has infantry. So yep. for me, to be, that... To be fair to Sean, though, we only rolled three. Mm. So I, I, I can't remember who got the opportunity to place. And then that could have have changed it as well, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, but just for 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 listeners, viewers who who have the opportunity to not do this, if you see a tank platoon across from you, lots of stewards in it, don't try to to fight on its terms. Try to find, like, try to split it up. If you're Panzer Faust, split it up if you can. Um, that's that. The other thing, you're gonna get shot to pieces. But Sean had a really good list. Panzer mm. three. 38 really good uh, armored car, yeah. two good transports, two yeah. two howitzers. Yeah, it was a good list. Just it never let him, it yeah. never let him use it badly. Yeah. 
So we come to game, game three, which was the final game of, of day one for you. Were you tired at yes. this point? No. No. Nope. This is this is another thing. I was I sound so weird to say, but I was making sure I was well hydrated. Yeah. Um lots of water, lots of good sugary drinks. Yep. Um, you know, I wasn't I never ate um a big lunch. I was just constantly eating small snacks yep. during the day, so I wasn't feeling bloated. It, it, I was fully aware of what I was doing. I was um, I'm not gonna say I was treating myself like an athlete. But I was conscious of well, what was going on. I, I at one point wrote a blog to to my team about how to you you know need to stay on top, and this includes physicality. And 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 they were like, "Does this mean I have to go jogging with you in the morning?" I was like, "No, you don't have to, but if you want to, you can come. I'm going to do it." And I agree that there is an an element of not athletes. We're not, but but you have to stay on top, mentally on top, and that that includes your body. Um, for a tournament. Yeah. So you were so facing in instance, Johnny Ferg in Operation Iceberg. Yeah, so Operation Iceberg was an objective-based game again, mm. and it was a quarters deployment situation. So you had one one objective, obviously, in your own um, yep. your own quarter. There was one in the centre. A Center was worth five points, your enemy objective is worth 10 points, and your own is worth one point. I am pretty sure that's how it was. Mm. And I I won the dice roll to choose mm. the table quarter. Yeah. And I I actually had to compromise myself a little bit here because Johnny has a multi-launcher. He had the land mattress. Let's just talk a little bit about Johnny's list because Johnny's True. was the the very weird uh, list which had enormous potential for both failure and success. He had a 16 order dice Gurkha list and it had four units of Gurkhas. It had three forward artillery observers, two flamers and four mixed HE which included a multi-launcher. So it was an enormous yeah. amount of shots coming in at you and, and those forward artillery observers could really mess up a, an enemy list, couldn't they? Yeah. Um, if they all come down, but that's the the big hurdle. Well, that's that's the trick. So yeah. Um. So I had to compromise my deployment because I picked the only table quarter that didn't have a building right in the middle of its quarter. Yeah. Because uh, I I just didn't want every time a multi launcher killing you. Yeah. Yeah. My own, within my own deployment zone, I just did not want it to happen. So compromise nope. myself. It was still a good defensible defensive um, area there was some you know lots of hedges and good soft cover so any ranged fire would it just went off can you still hear me Bo? yep i can you're back oh good um so it would still be a good defense but yeah as i said it compromised what I had. Mm. What was your plan looking at Johnny's list? And I'm I know you you know Johnny because um, because he uh, he he's also Scottish and and um, you played him before, haven't you? Yeah, it was. Um... Oh. I'd never played a list like this before. Okay. And I don't know that many people have. Mm. Um, the one thing I did do though is when I chose choose the board quarter, it meant that I had a road on my left flank that ran straight up into his board quarter. Yep. Um, but he had a really good defensive position. Mm. Really, really good defensive position. You know, he had um, he had his objective behind a building, and then behind that building there was a flamethrower team. The multi launcher mm. was sitting there. You know, he had um, he, he had it well defended. But I knew that I could just thrust an attack straight up that road. Mm. And then hopefully just try and gut everything. Um, yeah, because he, he doesn't a, have he doesn't have much uh, in the way of anti-tank, does he? No, I mean, the flamethrowers are the key. He had a, a Sherman 105 as well. Yep. Um, so good for putting pins out, but not so good for actually killing a tank. Yeah. Um, and he had that on reserve, um, but he did have a medium howitzer which he set up in light cover, 
and he covered that road. Of course he did, yeah. Yep. Um, but that was the plan. So the plan was that the the defensive force was going to be the medium machine gun team. The home guard were sitting mm. on the on the objective, uh, and I decided to have the crusader and the Bren carrier with the engineers mm. uh, to assist with the defence. Okay. Um, and so what transpired was that the you know the first dice came out, and I'm sure it was Johnny's, and he put that medium howitzer on ambush straight oh, away. Oh, he did. Knowing, yes. Knowing that the attack was coming. Um, mistake, a straight off mistake from Johnny was that the first steward that I rolled up, mm. um, I made sure it had hard cover, and he yep. took the shot and missed. Oh no! Yeah. 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 So he he absolutely went for it. So the second steward that came on ran straight up the road and then just dumped everything into this mm. gun. Um, yep. Didn't kill it, which is fair enough. So then I brought a truck up yep. with the 10 uh, regular Indians. They jumped out and then, yeah, the gun was gone. Mm. So he he was baited into doing something far too early and he, and he did it. Well, yeah. Um, so that meant I had my attacking force that was quite far up the board um, quite early. Mm. And I was aware that he, he did have some counterattack to go. Um, and it did mean, though, then, so that in the centre, I had uh, two more Stuarts go up the centre mm. yep. with uh, a couple of the small teams just to claim the middle objective. And it meant that one Stuart could break off to the right flank to help defend my sector, and the other Stuart could either go f- straight forward or break off to the left flank to yep. assess with the attack, which was um, which was good. So then, basically, dominating the central position would be like the decisive moment of this game. Once you were there, you could basically decide where you wanted the the fight to be, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but then he decided to fire off all three of his forward object and um, forward artillery observers at the same time. Yeah, and they all arrived all at the same time. Oof. Yeah, it was it was quite scary. Um, yeah. I I almost ran out of pin markers. Yeah, from a bag. Yeah, but he he only got one he only got one direct hit, and that was on the uh, the home guard. And I had already elected for them to go down, so half the number of hits they failed yeah. their green check. They rolled a one, so they actually almost pinned out. Um, but that was the only real effect of damage. So then I spent the next turn rallied everything. Um, and I, and was I'd that enough to, to get you going again? Yeah, yeah, I, I had weathered the storm. Yeah. Um so he had he had pinned all the defensive units and mm. the two Stuarts in the centre. <coughs> he hadn't impacted my attacking unit, my attacking force at all. Um and then I had one forward observer to shoot back at him mm. and I managed to catch he had three Gurkha units. Yeah. Pushing that was his, his attacking force, three Gurkha units and two officers. Yeah, and I think as well the two out of the three observers were there. Um, so I managed to pin the three Gurkha units and the two officers, and for the life of them, they they stopped moving. They just stopped. Um, <laughs> I cannot I cannot remember if it was dice rolls that failed. Or if it was poor positioning of the officers that they weren't providing the the leadership bonus, but his attack just stopped dead. Oh, that he did, sucks. He did try and get one unit of Gurkhas around a building on mm. on his flank into my quadrant, um, and I broke off the the brain carrier with the engineers to deal with them, mm. and I managed to put four four pins on them. <coughs> um. And that stopped him because he took a blood curdling charge as his um, national trait. Yep. So, you know, if he charges, I don't get defensive fire. Okay. But if you've got if you've got four pins, you're going to. You're not charging. Yeah. You're not charging. Yep. So, um, so my my flamethrower team and the engineers actually flamed out. So yep. I just had three guys with submachine guns stand in front of six Gurkhas and just. Stop them. <laughs> right. And, and 
And then, as I said, the Crusader, she was just amazing. Mm. Uh, in eventually, I think around turn five, some of the Gurkha units did actually break cover, and she just drove up and just, she was like a street sweeper, just made them yeah. all disappear. Yeah. And, did you and, make any sorry, mistakes my, that you want to point out? For myself, none. Mm. None at all. No. Um, no. The, the attack was good. The attack pushed through. <coughs> it killed his Sherman. Um, it sorted out his flamethrower team. Everything that was on the defensive, it, it just sorted them out. Yeah. Um, Did you have to sacrifice some of your tanks in that assault? Um, I think I lost one Stuart, yeah. but nothing that nothing that wasn't. At no point was I at risk okay. of not winning from about turn three onwards. And I think mm. some of Johnny's early mistakes opened up some doors yeah. Uh, yeah. that I walked, I could walk through. Um, but I mean, it was it was still an enjoyable game. Uh, but yeah, that was that was Johnny's game. Good on he you for surviving three forward artillery observers. I have played against such a list, and it's insane. It it it. You either ignore it and and hope for the best, or I, I, it it completely dominates everything you do for a whole whole game. Either or. And, and, and that's what I had to do. I just ignored them. It's like, yep. if you're going to get your hits, you get your hits. Exactly. And, yep. and, and he didn't. So then we go into day two. Um, and your first game was cleanse for uh, game number four, which I yep. don't know what is. So you're going to have to explain the, the game to us. Cleanse. I'm not sure if I was, I'm not sure if that's the right mission because I'm sure we had objectives. I don't know. I, uh, I was going off what the juggers themselves wrote. So, um, no, I'm sure, I'm sure it was an objective mission because I remember the night okay. before. Yeah. And I was reading Gary Morgan's list mm. and just realizing that I did not want to play this guy in an objective yeah. mission because he yeah. had so many more infantry units than I did. He did. Um, by the way, Gary Morgan had a 1919 order dice American uh, list. It was skirmish heavy, so loads of infantry. Five marine units with BARs, uh, double in most of them, I believe. Yep. Two engineer units, a multi-rocket launcher, bunch of teams, and two MGMCs as well. So it was really scary lists to play in an objective mission. Yep. And and I'm I'm super sure it was an objective mission. Um, yep. I'm sure there was there was objectives in each quarter. Mm. I'm sure your own was worth one. Your own was worth one. The neutrals were worth five. Your opponents was worth ten. Okay. <coughs> he also had two um, jeeps with medium machine guns in the armored car slot. He did. Yeah, so lots of lots of skirmish abilities. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of good fast movers, yeah. um, and those, and we had a uh, head of offers as well. So, so what was the fight. plan for for the, for that uh, that game? How do you fight against something that has so much infantry? For me, mate, it was um, I was I was purely doing a standoff. I was going to go a uh, fully defensive. Yeah. Survive for as long as possible and, and, and try kill some units and then push late late game? Yep, that, that was yep. precisely it. So my right flank, um, I brought a spear on and a truck with the Indians just to, to get that objective. But he, he had already rushed that flank really fast. Mm. He had um, three units of Marines and one of those... Um, uh, gun carriages, as I like to refer to them, you know, because yep. he's got a heavy auto cannon, two heavy yep. machine guns on it. Mm. He already had them in my sector before my reserves were coming on. Oh. So, yeah, he, yep. he was he was really quick. Yeah, he was really really quick. He had held his um, both his dodges, both his engineer squads, both his officers, and a bazooka team in reserve. Um, because there was no outflank on this mission, so mm. I knew that any attack that I could put on, 
he had an amazing counter attack. There was a counter him. coming right at you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was a twisty road in the in the middle, so I knew also that if he really wanted to take his his big chances, he could send both those trucks up that road, and then yeah. he would be right into my quadrant. So I had um, I had two Stuarts sitting in light cover, yeah. covering that road. <coughs> I did not want it to happen, uh, and then pushing in my left flank into the neutral quarter. Uh, Man, he forward deployed a sniper onto the objective. So oh. he had his own. He already had one of the neutrals and he had a really strong attack on, on the other neutral ob- objective. Wow. That, uh, but that both sounds very, very aggressive, but, but at yeah. the same time also very, very scary to play against. Yeah. It was it was it was a really he's a really clever opponent, had a really good army for the for the mission. Yeah. Um, and he, he had the tools to kill Stuarts. Yeah, he did. And so I decided to go fully defensive on the other neutral objective because I did eventually claim it. Mm. Um, and then it turned, in, it turned into a standoff. Yeah. He, there was that sort of little um, uh, farm courtyard that blocked a good portion line of sight. And on, around one corner, he had one of the gun carriages on ambush. And then around the other corner, I had one of the Stuarts on ambush. Um, and that was the standoff. Nobody tied moving. <laughs> nope, nobody was moving. And also tied up uh, two of his marine units mm. because they knew if they walked around the corner, they would get absolutely stripped to bits. Yep. Uh, I managed to take out his multi launcher pretty quick. And then uh, I managed to get some indirect fire onto his buffers. Mm. And I got rid of that, so I, I killed a lot of his long-range support. And it was at that point where I decided that I pushed my Stuart forward. Uh, sorry, that's a lie. I pushed the Crusader forward because we had a there was a river section okay. that had one bridge. So I pushed the Crusader and sat her right on it and put her on ambush. And then I started, this is the one time actually that the home guard had to leave the deployment zone. Mm. They had to start pushing forward to claim this other neutral objective. Uh, They were supported by another Stuart. They were supported by sniper fire. They were supported by mortar fire. And they were supported by the medium machine gun team that was putting on um, suppression fire on the sniper, on the objective. So it was a well supported, but it was just to stop his counter attack. Yeah. Uh, the Crusader sat there on ambush, just like a little guardian angel. You, why would you bring a soft skin anywhere near two light auto cannons? Oh, two light auto cannons that that will immediately kill you. Yeah. yeah. And and that's that is then what happened. He didn't bring them anywhere nearer. So um, he chose not to to complete that attack. Yeah. Yeah. He chose not to counter attack, and I just edged forward, edged forward. Yeah. And then eventually, um, I flushed the sniper off. I pushed the center a little bit to try and uh, tempt these these uh, these out uh, these reserves to come on. And eventually, they did come on, and they came on to defend his own his own mm. quadrant. Because I I actually made a sacrifice play. I made the Bren carrier go up the road with the engineers, and I Ooh. got within. I got within like seven inches of his objective, and mm. that's when he thought I was pushing the attack. So he countered yeah. pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Well, you more or less forced his hand there because he's going to have to do something to counter that, isn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. And my indirect fire was starting to take a toll yeah. um, on his units, but the the Crusader again, she was amazing, just on ambush. You mm. don't see the turret just swinging from left to right, and mm. he actually fell foul of it in the end. Um, I sustained the ambush for at least two turns, and at the end of every turn, when you're picking up the order, I actually told him, "It's like, look, just so you know, I'm I'm keeping ambush on on that tank." Yep. And he whipped out toward the the death of the game. He um he whipped out one of his. Uh, Armored jeeps, yeah, 
And then as soon as it stopped, I went ambush and he screamed <laughs> of despair. <laughs> and he knew. He yeah. knew he'd made a mistake. Yeah. And he even said, it's like, I should have brought it around the other way. Because yeah. if he'd come round the other side of this copse of trees, I had my, my forward observer was running to, to claim oh, the objective. So so he, he would have been in the way. Yeah, but he needed to be there. There was no other choice for me to do okay. it. Um, but that, that standoff, the defensive standoff mm. uh, that I had, it remained until the end of the game. So that was the key. That was the key moment, actually. Um, any mistakes you want to point out from any of the players, you or uh, Gary? Um, look, other than him forgetting the the ambush, and I think maybe a lack of aggressiveness from him. Mm. Um, there was a point where I'm sure I'm sure it was around turn three, as that ambush standoff had started, that if he'd have sacrificed something he could have pushed the attack yeah um because he's, he's... That, that is unfortunately what you have to do sometimes sometimes if the enemy has like one key unit you have to yeah. feed it something in order to to push yeah yeah um i didn't see i didn't see any mistakes from myself there was nothing that i was looking down and going okay wish i'd done that too. no that's actually a lie there was i needed I needed to bring the truck on with the Indians in it. And I knew I needed to bring it on in a particular place. And I knew if I brought it on, he was instantly going to move infantry in to destroy the truck. And that's exactly what happened. Mm. I should have been able to find a different way of doing that. But I... You, I you couldn't. Yeah. I didn't. Um, so that was maybe not an error, but lack of um, lack of imaginative thinking. Yeah. But in the end, it turned out to be a major victory, which was all I was after. Yeah. So at this point, you're well ahead of the game. Major victories all around, and there are only like a few players who are anywhere close to where you were at at this point. Um, So so it was always going to come down to one final glorious finale against Richard at this point. Yeah. And look, at the end of game four, I had done the maths. And you know, I knew where I knew where Richard was points wise. Yeah. Uh, and I knew that he needed a major victory against me, and he also needed to uh, virtually wipe me out. Yeah. To increase his tiebreaker and um, to win the event. Um, but I will so... say that, that 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 didn't give me any sense of comfort going into the game. No, because Richard is not a Mister Whosoever. He 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 knows his stuff. He's a really good player. And his yeah. list is really, really good. I had, uh, when I reviewed it, said that this was the list you had to beat in, in order to win. And I guess I was right. It Because game five was priority targets, um, which I guess is another key points variant, maybe? Yes, it's, it's kill points variant. Okay, kill point variant. Okay. Um, you were playing Richard with his 17 order dice Gurkhas. He had four units of Gurkhas, two of them were Paragurkhas, uh, two Darker Stewards, a lot of mixed support, so basically more or less um, the best you can build with Brits. It had two of each of the supports. That was one scary list, and that was one scary player. What was your plan going into this? Well, it was a deployment mission, and I'd never met Richard before, but I knew his reputation, and I knew he was a good player. And we both knew it was the top table, and we both shook yep. hands, and we were both very cordial yep. and friendly. And, um, you know, talk, you're, you're going through these early stages, talk about the terrain. We were we had a little discussion on how we would track the points, because the points yep. for the mission, at the start of every turn, you would roll a dice on a table, and you got extra bonus points for killing that particular unit type. Okay. Um, so we, we had to drop a little grid to track mm. points each turn um, so we could keep a tally of what was going on. And then we started to deploy. And I I have only on a handful of occasions had this with another player where you start talking about the deployments and what you're thinking. Mm. And he, he put a unit of Gurkhas down. 
And then I reached down to pick up a unit and Richard says, like, you're going for your medium machine gun team, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, I am. He's like, yeah, because that's what I would reach for too. Yeah. And I deploy it. And then yeah. that that rapport went backwards and forwards. That's brilliant we, when that happens. <laughs> it's really good. And, and, and we quickly realized that it's like, yeah, we are both fully up to speed with the rules. We both know our tactics. Yeah. This is going to be, you know, a really, really good game. Yeah. Um, the table had a lot of um, complete buildings and a lot of open roads. So we were laughing and joking. It's like this this could be a bit like um, Mad Max, Beyond mm-hmm. Thunderdome style thing. Running straight ahead and yeah. Yeah, yeah, it could have been because we shooting as you go. We we both held very similar units in reserve. He yeah. had his uh, India pattern carrier mm. with engineers in it. He had yep. a Jeep with a flamethrower team and an officer in it. I had my Bren carrier with engineers and Jeep and a flamethrower team. So our reserves were the same. That was our yep. both our counter attacks were the same. Um and you know what, mate? My my position here was just to hold the line and yep. see what he did. I, avoid I the going, avoid the the major loss at all cost. I wasn't going. Yep, I wasn't going to be the aggressor. No. So I was I was counselling patience to myself, mm. and then something quirky happened. He deployed um, his forward observer, and we'd been talking backwards and forwards for about ten minutes. And I thought, there's no way this guy has made a mistake. There's no way he's doing this. Because I still had my sniper to put down. Ooh. And so I thought, I thought there was some sort of cunning plan. It's like, is he baiting me to put the sniper down, knowing that I need a 3+, plus, then a 4+, plus to kill it? Assuming that I'll fail, and then he can roll one of the stewards forward and kill the sniper and get the dice? Oh. Is he thinking like that? I think that's the level we were at. And it was amazing. But I put the sniper down though, because you can't not, you can't not take it. Did Did you kill his forward observer? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Did. Yeah. So I killed his forward observer. Um, my artillery strike came in and put some heavy pins on stuff. And then the game started to develop because he had a SAS jeep as well, and the forward observer, the forward observer clipped the jeep and immobilized it. Um, but what that meant was that on that particular turn I think we had rolled that soft skins gave you extra bonus points so I became quite aggressive with one of the stewards and rolled it very right quite far it. forward yeah. to get the points um, and so then I had to move elements up to support that tank you know, oh, to, no. to, to keep it alive so it was supported by another steward so both those stewards were putting pins on the enemy stewards to keep them keep them occupied. And the, his two stewards never moved all game nope. from where they from where they deployed just by the pins that went on them. Mm. Um but then his counterattack happened. Uh, and I was a little bit overstretched, but that but that was okay. The kills were still flowing towards me. Um in the center I had the Crusader. Mm. And he had he had the Marmon Harrington so it's got Reggie. Um, so, you know, he knew instantly that I was going to put the Crusader around on ambush and use yeah. the Stuart to shoot at it to make it move past the yeah, Crusader yeah. so the Crusader could kill it. He knew that. He, he's he's a smart guy. And I'm chuckling away. It's like, he, 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 I hope it works. Um, it didn't, did it? I can't remember. The, the, the Harrington lived. Mm. It survived. Um. But this this backwards and forwards was was going on, but I was still acquiring the kills, yeah. um, and the game was played in extremely good spirits, extremely tactically. Uh, so I think going into the last turn, I was six points ahead. Okay. And I think it was maybe the turn before I had this big discussion about greed. When you know you've got the advantage, how yeah. greedy do you want to get? How greedy do you want to push? Um. And I have to say, I didn't get greedy, but there was a moment, I'm sure the term was said was, you know, I've, I've got the run of the board at yeah. that particular time. Um, you know, a lot of my tactics could move without disadvantage or without threat. Mm. Um, 
And so I took advantage of that to, to make a few things happen. One really cool thing that I had never done before was, have you, and you might have done it, have you ever shot light auto cannons into a building? Yes. Oh, do it. It's amazing. It is amazing. amazing. It's really cool. Yeah. Yep. You're shooting, Especially you're if you hit multiple times, it's really good. Yeah. Well, yeah, because, <laughs> you know, for the, for, the, for the audience, you're shooting four one-inch templates into a building, and each one-inch template causes D3 hits. Exactly. Absolutely phenomenal. It's so God. He, it's God mode. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and yeah. of course, you ignore you ignore cover because you're firing HE. Yep. Um, so I comfortably kept one of his units of Gurkhas in a building. Um, but I knew I knew what he had set up. He had an attack set up. Mm. The Gurkhas were going to explode out that building into the middle. Of course they would. Yeah. They would have. They would have gutted my um, home guard. They would have got the 25-pounder. They would have got maybe the mortar a little bit later on. Mm. The Crusader stopped that. Yep. Um, and he was also hoping for a last dice, first dice situation with that Marmon Harrington because there was a huge twisty road section that he could have zipped down and mm. fired those twin machine guns. And he would have got the 25-pounder as well. Um, but the Crusader on ambush, she stopped that. She stopped any of that nonsense. She was phenomenal. <laughs> But what happened in the last turn was that we rolled for priority target and we yeah. rolled small teams, small weapon teams. Mm. And at that point, my flamethrower team was exposed. My medium machine gun team was exposed. Mm. So um, I lost the game by two points. He got eight victory points in the last turn. Wow. Yeah, simply, simply because of the quirk of the player pack, the, the rules pack for the mission. That, that let him get that. Um, that that is a really good comeback for Richard. Um, yeah, I mean, it was. I'm not. I'm not going to say it was a bitter pill to swallow. Um, no, but it was. You, it was the game. Yeah, but once I mean, even Richard said, "It's like, look, mate, if you did it on raw dice count, our dice counts were equal at the end. Mm. So, on any given day, that would have been a draw. Yeah. Um, but it was the most enjoyable." top table game I have ever experienced in any game system anywhere and Richard is an exceptionally good player exceptionally good guy uh, his knowledge of the rules is fantastic mm. we we only we only called a TO over once yeah. out of pure laziness because we couldn't remember if HE um, ignored uh, extra protection in a building but it was it was the top table it was game 5 and yeah. we just thought you didn't you didn't bother to, to look into the rule book. <laughs> let's, let's not waste time. And we knew yeah. we were on. A, it's a good so easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But we knew we were on a good rapport with yeah. each other. Neither of us were yeah. trying to win any sort of mental no. game with each other. Um, and obviously, for the record, it it does cancel out extra protection. Does <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, yeah. And so, yeah, for a top table game at a GT, that was, was amazing. That was um, amazing. So, so Any was obvious mistakes lot. you're pointing out here? You you mentioned that that uh, the greed. Greed. There was a tiny bit of greed that I let slip. Yeah. And that was when I um, brought my jeep with a flamethrower on, and I ran the flamethrower out of it. So that I could get closer to his um, India pattern carrier to pop it, which I did, and I had a dice advantage at that point, and I was hoping for first dice. Oh, uh, yeah. So that the flame, so that would mean that the flamethrower was going to be able to hit one of his stewards or double back and hit his engineer squad. Yeah. Um. So there was greed there, but there was only greed in hindsight. Mm. Because that flamethrower team died, actually gave him three victory points. But I, I could never have known that we were going to roll could, small you, weapons. Yeah, teams. yeah, yeah. So you um, you took a you took a risk, and it it massively backfired. Uh, but it was not a a, a completely. It, it was it backfired. It wasn't something that I could have ever seen coming because it no, we could not easily a, have rolled. Yeah, yeah, we could have easily have rolled. You know, HQ units. <gasps> Which we actually did on the first turn when my sniper killed his observer. Ah! <laughs> um, 
Uh, so that was a mistake. I, that was a mistake from Richard's uh, from Richard's side. I uh, I I will never deploy my forward observers if I know that there is a sniper coming on. I I don't want to yeah. do that. Um, he admitted that it was a mistake yeah. on his part, yeah. and I'm still convinced that he was he'd done the maths. <laughs> the three plus, the I'll three take plus the chance, the whatever. <laughs> right. Um, but I, I cannot speak highly of Richard. I would. I would play him every weekend if I could, because mm. uh, he would push me to be even even better yeah. than I than I am or that I think I am. Those are the best games, right? Where where you yeah. both connect on a personal level, but at the same time you connect on a game level where you sort of you don't need to talk that much about the game, although you do. But but you, you know what's going on, both of you, and and it, yeah, that's that's really cool, right? It was really refreshing. And that meant that you won. Yep. Um, and uh, so before we finish off, I, I just want to finish by by maybe talking about the... Oh, there we go. Look at that. Yeah. The shinies. Let's put that. Right. Uh, put that there. Let's just talk about... And, and that's just... That's the weirdest trophy ever. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> I know it's a reference like to Churchill's fingers, uh, but it's just a weird. It it's it looks weird. Anyway, um, lesson learned. Um, what was the the standard operating procedure, the SOP for you uh, at a tournament? Do you have anything that you want to impart to the viewers that you think is a good approach to 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 going to a tournament, to going to games, uh, approaching that game? Um, anything you want to to say to that? Read the player pack. Yeah. Read it and carefully. Read it again and understand understand what it is, what it says. Mm. Gary Morgan had to ask partly through the game how objectives were claimed or contested. Yep. That's I'm not criticizing Gary. Oh, but, but what but... It, what it meant was that he was wasting mental time trying to remember how they Adapting were contested and during just... the play. Yeah. And not just playing. Yep. Uh, understanding your own special rules mm. for your army, and not forgetting them. Mm. Um, you know, I've actually seen people forget forget gun shields and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, silly, silly little things. Just it happens all the time. Yeah. It does, but understand what your different units can do. Mm. And uh, look, during the event itself, no, what I said at the start, I went to the Battle of Britain Grand Tournament because I wanted to win. Yep. And I would do my very best to win. Mm. Set, and I think you said this on one of your videos recently, set your expectations for yourself. What is it that you want to do? Do you yep. want to go and have fun? Yeah. And say exactly. some toy soldiers, then, yep. then go. Don't get upset if there's other people there that, that are there to compete, and because exactly. that's what they've decided to do. Yeah. Um, those would be the the main the main approaches for for the event. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't even necessarily say you don't need to practice with your army. If you play bolt action a lot, <laughs> you should be able to pick up any army and, and just use it. Um, More or less, especially if you're playing like you you're doing with the. Uh toolbox lists uh, if if you're playing toolbox lists uh, in in multiple armies the armies are not that different uh, not so really. that's an that's an easier transition than if you go from a purely assault army to a all recce army or whatever uh, th those changes are a little bit bigger i i would recommend a little bit of training for that <laughs> Um, what about the uh, deployment? Did you make like make plans beforehand and and had tactics for what you wanted to set down first, or was that up to each game and and each opponent? Um, it really no, it is, it is game by game, army by army. You want to see, you want to draw out your opponents' um, units that you, not that you fear the most, but you know can do the most damage. Mm. You know, so putting down to say they're inconsequential, it's not fair. Um, but stuff like the home guard would always go down quite early. Yeah. 
putting the mortar down quite early um, mm. is always another one. Uh, because and it, and are you are you are you deploying them away from where you already know that you want to attack? Because most of the games you described, you were attacking on one flank. Um, yeah. So yeah, is is that like a, a thing that you do? You sort of lure your opponent to to deploy somewhere else than what where you want to go? No, it's not a, a deployment lure. Um, everything. I mean, the if it's an objective, if it's an objective game, I would like the mortar to be at least two run moves away from from an objective, so that if it's got nothing to shoot at, it can run there. Um, yep. If it's a kill points game then it has to be somewhere where it's going to be protected mm. because it's going to be using its um, observer to to do its um, spawn for it. Uh, the 25 pounder should be covering an area of the tabletop, whether or not it's to act as a defensive unit or to support an attack, um, just as long as it looks, you know, pretty cool and threatening. Yep. Um, I suppose as well, the combinations needed to work other than the first game. I knew that my Crusader would have to shepherd at least two of the Stuarts around okay. uh, to be aggressive with. Yep. I, I only brought that Crusader on in the first game because I saw Simon saw low-hanging mm. fruit from mm. the the home guard, and then yeah. I saw the low-hanging fruit from the the Maxim. Yeah. Um, so that's the only reason it didn't support the attack. Every other game, it was shepherding two of those stewards, and it was perfect. So, for uh, uh, early game, mid game, and late game, are there any particular things that you think people should uh, learn from you to focus on um, during these three periods of of, uh, of yeah. the game? Yeah, early game. Early game, you've got to set your defense mm. if, if 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 it's required. Early game, if there are uh, indirect weapons and multi launchers, you have to put pins on them to, mm. to stop them working. Don't try and kill them, just pins. Yeah. So if you've got a sniper, your sniper should be tasked to shoot at multi launchers or medium howitzers or heavy howitzers. Yeah. So the early game is set the defense and put some pins out to minimize incoming fire. Uh, when you're moving to the mid game, mid game you should already be starting to to start to push forward. Yeah. Uh, almost almost like you're pushing forward to your your second line of of defense. Um, you know, and that that should be the mid the midway the midpoint yeah. of the table. Yeah. And you're like always close always... to objectives, not not necessarily on objectives, but but closer to where you want to to finish up. Yeah, yeah, because don't don't overstretch yourself, uh, mm. and also be aware of what can come back at you. And this is where reserves. If your opponent's got reserves, mm. and they're in wheeled vehicles, they've got a good reach. Yeah, you know, especially if there's a road. If there's a road far out, it's yeah. just a nightmare. Um. But if they've not got a road, they're still 12 inches forward, and then there's 6 inches for the infantry, so that's 18 inches of physical movement, plus yeah. the weapons range. Yeah. Uh, so for something like a you know, a Panzerfaust, yeah. there's um, 22 inches, yeah. and that's, that's, that's him hitting you uh, on, a, on a 3. Mm. If you're, if you're, if you so stay back and 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 know those ranges uh, is a is yes, a good. Yes, uh, that's yeah. that's exactly it. So knowing that if you go twenty four inches, mm. you are mm, you should be yeah. reasonably okay. But if yeah. you push beyond that halfway line, then, then you're in then, the danger zone. Yeah, then you're exposed to the counter attack. Yeah. <sighs> what about late slurping? game? Uh, late game tactics. Do you have any late like? Late game, late game. I think if we reference the last game we've spoken about, yeah, greed, yeah, got to control. Greed. Keep it in check. Yeah, you you know you you get excited about trying to win the game or sweeping your opponent before you. If that counter attack hasn't come, you've got to control greed. Yeah, um, and that's something that I think I said to you 
maybe privately or maybe recorded about a year ago. Mm. I was, or maybe six months ago. I was suffering from this this yep. desire to just push forward, be aggressive, push yeah. forward, be aggressive, and try and you know, um, I was trying to to kill order dice in the early game to yeah. get that advantage quickly to win the game yeah. quickly. Yeah. And and it was it was starting to cost cost me as yeah. as my opponents, regular opponents, understood what it was I was trying to do. Mm. Control greed and patience. That yep. that for me is your late game tactics. I, I completely agree. It's very, very important to, to control that. Yeah. So coming back from the tournaments, any uh, any like takeaways? Did it all work as it as it was planned? Did the, the list work as it was planned? Um your reading of the, the pack, all of that, was that uh I, I mean I guess it would be because you won so but yeah. You you know you never know. There might be something in there. <laughs> had no, no, to ask. Like, uh, I knew the weaknesses of the army, mm. um, and and some people might be bemoaning. You know, you had four stewards. How is it weak? So, oh. No, it had it had really big and obvious weaknesses. It's glaringly weak in the infantry yeah. section. Yeah. Um, you know, objective games were really hard work. If I if I yeah. couldn't do the kills. You know, objective games were really, really tough. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel fortunate that I avoided some armies that had a lot of more anti-tank. Um, mm. You know, I never, I never seen a Soviet dog mine the entire weekend. Oh, that was lucky. Yes, yes, it was. Uh, I only ever had one Panzerfaust fired at me, and it destroyed a tank. But it was a Romanian Panzerfaust. And that was that was the only Panzerfaust that was fired at me. Mm. Uh, the only real anti-tank that was ever shot at me was either a light anti-tank gun or a heavy auto cannon. Um, and they're they're okay, but they're not great. So they're, they're not going to to they're not going to yeah. stop four stewards and a crusader. That that yeah. And look, the crusader. She never even received a single pin the entire weekend. <laughs> so, so she's like the pride of your collection now. Did did you like uh, paint little kill markings on her, or <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't do it. She's just too nice. Um, <laughs> but it, it, I, it's it's that analysis in the end that I was able to protect mm. my troops. Yeah. Um. So that I always had some sort of some infantry backup to plug those gaps to claim those objectives. Mm. It was making use of every single infantry team that was there. So the yeah. forward observer, as soon as he's fired, he needs to be pushing forward, yeah. in cover, protected to get close to objectives. Um, you know, I, I couldn't play. What's the best time I couldn't play fast and loose. No, nope. with. Nope. With the infantry, there was no way I could risk them, because nope. uh, they always they always needed to live. They needed to stay alive. And on the whole, they they did. And uh, I'm, right. I'm glad of it. So, are you um, are you moving back to your Soviets now, or are are you going someplace new, Germans, or um, what's well, up next for you? Well, it's, I'm actually on a bit of a sabbatical from from gaming at the moment because mm. uh, there's no events in Scotland in July uh, due to cancellations, okay. and then there's my own event, the Megatron Three Thousand, which I will speak to you about in another video. You will. Um, but the Megatron Three Thousand is coming up in August, so I'm the tournament so organizer that, for that. So that's the next thing. But but since you're organizing, you're not playing it. Right. I will not be playing. I cannot play at it. There's 44 players. It is insane. Oh, oh, oh that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I cannot play at it. There's too much to do. Yeah. Um, but domestically, uh, the Scottish Championship, you yeah. you get bonus points for using additional nations. Yeah. Um, so I've already won an event within Scotland using the Soviet Union. So they are now on the shelf for... Okay. The rest of the year, poor guys. <laughs> so you're doing something else. Yes. Right. So, look, I said 
when we were talking about games, I'm a huge fan of Romania. Mm. Um, and I am now, I've got a love affair with autocannons. So uh, I think some Romania with uh, Kugelblitz as the access ah, support. Nice. Big fan. That sounds good. Or if I really, really, really want to push it, uh, the, what's it called? The Panzer IV with the four light autocannons on it. Oh, the uh, um, Wirbelwind or something like that. Oh, the Wirbelwind, that's it. Yeah, that's it. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because two light old cannons was great. Four must be really good. <laughs> but it's open job, Dallas. <laughs> I'll figure it out. <laughs> You'll figure it out, yeah. right? Thank you so much for joining me, Alistair, for this. And thank I thank thank you for all the viewers who stuck with us. It's, we're almost at the two hour mark. So I know it was a long one, but I really hope that everyone learned something from it. Alistair, congratulations on winning again. And uh, so much. that was it from us this time. I will talk to you when we talk about uh, Megatron. Yeah. Take care, yeah. guys. Stay safe. That was it. I am logging off now. Just a sec. Here we go.